let's welcome uh, Eight Chan and uh, Saki Chan. ちょっと自己紹介してまいりましょう。はい。はい。ボンジュー。ジマペレツコヤスコーチ、アンシャンテ。ヤスコーチと申します。よろしくお願いします。大家好、我叫严赫沙旭。塩ヶ崎と申します
uh, writing system, then you should learn Taiwan Mandarin. And then when we uh, master the phonetic symbols in Taiwan, we continue to learn to read like Chinese. So, 人人生而自由在尊严和权利上一律平等. So kids, they learn how to read Chinese characters in Taiwan this way. So we don't use pinyin. And also Taiwan Mandarin is considered a dialect of Mandarin. And so there are some like minor differences. Okay, so I grew up monolingually and I never thought about the learning language because I didn't even want to learn my mother tongue. So if you speak Hakka to me, I would probably understand passively, but I cannot talk back. <laughs> and later, um, I'm a huge gamer. If you play online games or video games, you probably have played Ultima Online or like Princess Maker. <laughs> yeah, in Japanese, you can call me an otaku, or in English, if you know the word weeaboo, then I'm a weeaboo. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, I learned English just because I wanted to play Ultima Online with other players, and how to scam them, get more money, and get more like equipment, and you know, all, join all the online forum. And later, I shifted to Japanese games like um, Final Fantasy, uh, Dragon Quest, and Etc. So still, I wasn't interested in languages. I was only interested in playing games. I learned languages to play games. Okay. So, uh, so who initiated me to the this uh, polyglottery thing? Is that when I was in college, I met two incognito hyperpolyglots. My uh, English professor, uh, Dr. Karen Chong, and uh, my Latin professor. Dr. Valentino, they were all like hyper polyglots. And I think they, all, they are like Richard, speak 50 to 60 languages, but they don't want people to know <laughs> about it. So, um, I, um, so I got a lot of inspiration that inspired me to become a polyglot. So I started to learn many, many different languages when I was 20. I studied out Deutsch, blah, 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 blah. I'm not going to talk about my language journey for like 50 minutes. Um, and I ended up uh, uh, being interested in exotic languages like Kichwa, Damara, Koe Koe, and even like Isi, Hosa, things like that. So currently, I'm uh, working on exotic languages. My next objective is Albanian. So. I will be in Albania next January, uh, February, and I hope I will be able to visit Richard in the Skopje uh, when I'm in, uh, okay, um, Albania. So that's me, and we also have other polyglots in Taiwan, and you probably have met a few <laughs> uh, here. So I want to introduce two guys, because they are really incredible. The first one, his uh, Yi Ming is called Wu Guojie Yi Shi. He's a certificate collector. He has uh, 10 C1 certificates in languages like uh, Tissus, Swedish, or uh, what, Dele, Dalf, or Testadaf, things like that. So he's a <laughs> collector. And he continues to take a lot of like, lang language exams. The other guy I want to tell, introduce is uh, the one holding the British flag. His name is Xiao Cai. And uh, he refuses to learn any major languages, like Spanish. French, German, <laughs> the languages that other people want to learn. And he focuses on like uh, Southeast, Asia, Southeast, Asia, Southeast Asian languages like Burmese, Khmer, <laughs> Thai, Vietnamese. And he mastered all these languages to the level um, that he can do like translation. I'm not kidding. He is really good at all, at all these Southeast Asian languages. And he is also good at South, like Indian languages, he can read all the, you know, the, how do you call that? The, 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 yeah, Devanari. Tian Chen Di, Devadigari. Okay, so, so we do have a very vibrant community in Taiwan, but we are also the first generation, because before us, there were no, almost uh, no, I mean, polyglots in Taiwan, so we are very young, okay? And what do we do when, uh, at the polyglot.tw. Oh, I forgot one thing and why I started this. I was actually a ling <coughs> linguistic student in United States. I sort of abandoned my studies because I wanted to contribute 
do some contribution to the education in Asia and in Taiwan, because you know, we suffer a lot here, and later you will see. So I quit my program and uh, went back to Taiwan and started this hope to do some educational reform. So we have four goals. First, we want to help learners learn more efficiently, especially struggled learners. Here in Japan, if you go out, I think more than 50% of the people here, or even 80% of people here, they are afraid of speaking English to you. And uh, it's the same still today. It's 2000, almost 20. And J Tokyo is going to host uh, the Olympic game. But they are still afraid of speaking English. And then uh, we hope hope to convert people to multilingualism. It's a language cult. <laughs> and then empower people through a language learning process. And later we hope to increase mobility and give them uh, more opportunities to work abroad. And finally, build a, a, be build a better world. Okay. Some theoretical background, why I um, started this and what I think about language learning. So. Um, does anybody study linguistics or in education? Yeah. Do you all know uh, Stephen Crushen, uh, language learning and language acquisition? Um, for people uh, who don't have never heard about this, I have to explain <laughs> a little bit. So basically, there are two type of type of types of um, human like learning process. The first one is called uh, explicit learning. For example, mathematics. You know what you are doing, and you have to learn what you are doing. You have to be taught. And if you don't use it, you will forget it. That's called explicit learning. And this is called, in language learning, it's called language learning. So it's a specific term. And the second type of language learning is called language acquisition. It's like riding a bicycle. And most of us learned, acquired our first language this way. So uh, you don't know how your native language works unless you are a linguist. I don't even know how Mandarin Chinese works, even though I know how English works. OK, so that's the basic distinction. There's one problem with language learning when you uh, want to apply it to the general public. Uh, did, did anybody go to uh, Professor Alex's talk this morning? He mentioned if you are a hyper polyglot, then you, you have to do language learning, like uh, formal studies or uh, systematic studies. But for the general public, they don't have the capability to do it. So if you apply only language learning in the general education system, they are going to fail, like him. This is one of our members, because uh, analytical ability, not, not everyone has analytical ability. And some of us are good, that, so some of us are good at math, right? But some of us are bad at math. I think most of us are bad at math, <laughs> <laughs> including me. So how can you expect everyone to do language learning analytical studies? Um, studies? So that's not impossible, right? And that's, I think, the ultimate reason, right? the fundamental reason why the language classes fail. OK, so this is my language teaching or learning philosophy. So we start, we want to change this, especially in East, in East Asia, people only uh, understand language learning. They don't, they don't understand language acquisition. So we have polyglot seminar, and we also have a polyglot cafe. Our polyglot cafe is very special. It's not just a language exchange, because if you do language exchange event here in Asia, you will end up speaking only English. <laughs> so we have a very special rule. We recruit volunteers from uh, different countries. For example, when we host a French table, we, uh, we would have one French native speaker, like in this photo. Have you seen Michael here? <laughs> is Michael here? Michael is actually in the photo. OK, um, that, this was like five years ago, and we had uh, Majid from Quebec, and he was hosting a French table for us. And we would have, at the same time, we, we would have other tables too, German, Vietnamese, Indonesian, even Cantonese. Etc. Et okay, so this is our polyglot cafe. So when you visit us in Taiwan, if you go to our cafe, we guarantee you like many language tables. It will not be only English. <laughs> okay. okay, and we have a cafe in Taipei, Taichung, Tainan, and Kaohsiung. These are like weekly meetups. And we also have a seasonal events in uh, Osaka. 
And finally, um, we also host the emerging programs. It's a controlled type of emerging. If you are, you were at the Alex's talk. So it's not just the going to that country and live there. We actually help you find local people who have time and patience to work with you or even just listen to you. And that's the whole purpose of this program. And we do emerging in the States and also Japan, Taiwan. And currently, we are actually doing an emerging program here in Japan. So that's why we have so many um, polyglot members here. So if you are interested, you can join us later since from tomorrow. It's only two days, but it's going to be fun. OK. So now it's our like uh, third bullet point. Language learners in East Asia, challenges and solutions. And why is it East Asia? Because it's actually a very, uh, from the inside, you see like differences. For example, uh, we all use chopsticks, right? In South Korea and in Japan and in Taiwan, we actually use chopsticks differently, if you are aware. And we also eat rice differently. For example, in South Korea, you cannot hold your bowl. It's not. It's considered a very rude. You can you, your bowl has to be on the table all the time, and that's why they use spoon and um, flat chopsticks to eat. And in Japan or in Taiwan, you have to hold your bowl while eating, and that's the minor differences. But from the outside, this area is actually very homogeneous because we all used to use kanjis, and we share 60 to 70 percent of vocabulary, and a lot of cultures, cultural similarities too. And I'm going to talk about four like cultural similarities. The first, the monolingualism, and the second, the English complex, and the third, the culture of humility, and finally, um, obsession with standard language proficiency tests. Okay. So um, here I'm going to um, uh, have you read a newspaper article from Japan. Um, that, can you read it for me? Japanese, right? The Kikoku Shijo, the Karama, you are a Tawa, and the Suge Hido Ijime Muketawa. Decide to eat in on Natasumi Goron in Nihon Nikikoku Ste, Hatsutoko, no Ego no Jigio, the Futuni Shabetara, Ego Shaberu Karate Kakotske and Janeo, to Ijime Raretana. 当然日本人発音をわざわざ覚えましたよ自衛のために So basically uh, here in Japan if you uh, lived abroad as a kid and uh, you grew up speaking perfect English and when you come back to Japan and you go to your regular English classes in high school or in junior high school most the kids would pretend that they don't speak perfect English. They have to hide their true identity. Otherwise, they would be bullied. And um, this is a very uh, re unique phenomenon. So I'm going to have Eichang to share like her experience in Japanese. どう思いますかこの現象について。えっと、こういうお話があったこと聞いたことがあります。えっと、日本は単一国家で単一言語で同じ髪の色、また同じ肌の色、えっと、が中学校とかに行ったらユニフォームもみんな同じユニフォームを
So um, Aja also mentioned that uh, uh, she know she knows a kid who uh, went to the U United States to do homestay for a month, and uh, he dyed his hair. But when he went came back to Japan, he has to dye it, he had to dye it back to black because uh, he didn't want to be different. So it makes learning language very difficult. Can you imagine? If you speak perfect French, then you will be bullied in school, school or even in your workplace. That's the trend, how like change the monolingualism affects your language learning. Nanka, nita yona taiken to ka arimasu ka? Nita yona taiken. Dou omimasu ka? Kone nite. Jigao se da. She's from a different generation, so maybe she has a different opinion on this. そうですね。確かにあのその例えば私の周りにも高校が結構国際的な高校だったので帰国子女の方も結構多かったんですけれどもやっぱり帰国子女の子ってあの自分が英語を喋れることを最初は隠すっていう習性がありました。えっとまあ一応国際の高校で英語を頑張りたいという子たちが多い高校だったんですけどそれでもそういうことが起こってたんで多分普通の高校だともっとすごかったんじゃないかなと思います。So uh, she went to an international school here in Osaka. Still, uh, if people were grew up abroad, they would hide their true identity first. And so she she thinks if it's already that bad in an international school, it would be worse in a like regular high school. Okay, so that's the first obstacle or challenge we face. The second is the English complex. Okay, so here uh, we have a very poor English. Uh, teaching environment. Many English teachers, they don't even speak English. If you have been an ALT here in Japan and you know that, they, uh, are, they are afraid of you because you are going to talk to them in English. And people spend like more than 2,000 hours in school and in cram school or bushiban or juku, uh, learning English for more than 10 years, but they still cannot speak it. So they would think, okay, I'm just not talented. I'm stupid and uh, English is so hard. They are traumatized by this learning experience. So they cannot even think of learning other languages. And they don't think they can even learn one foreign language. OK, um, the third, then here's an outcome in Japan, very interesting. So one, um, this Japanese, uh, like a Goen worker, he didn't want to charge foreigners because he was too afraid. <laughs> And so the, the place lost like a Nissan Go Hakumayan, that's uh, how much is that? Uh, two, 250,000 US dollars because of uh, his, <laughs> this uh, English complex. And also uh, this cultural, like East, Eastern Asian general culture just emphasizes the importance of being, being humble or modest. So here we have the same word like Kyung Song, Tian Shu, Ken Song, and that's uh, Vietnamese. I didn't include Vietnam in this discussion because uh, um, I don't really know much about Vietnam. Okay, so when you uh, expect to be humble, you people always say less than they actually know. And when don't, they don't get the perfect sentence, they don't want to speak up. So you know that's bad for learning languages. And finally, we, had a, we have an, a tradition of imperial examination. Uh, which today in these countries we have uh, Sunong, Gaokao, Zhikang, and Sentasiken. So students, they don't learn English to communicate. They learn English to pass the exams. And when they have that as a goal, you know they are not going to master it. Our solutions, like how to change people's mindset, you know, or behavior. So first, I would, I would ask them to value their own languages especially in the case of Taiwan. Look at the map. It's actually a multilingual country, but people function monolingually. They think they can only speak Mandarin Chinese, and they don't count Taiwanese or Hakka or other indigenous languages as language. And so they cannot apply their Taiwanese learning experience to English or other languages. So, uh, one time I was interviewed by a politician during a language show and he was saying something like, oh, you know, all those Euro European nobles, they speak multiple languages. How did they do that? 
And I talked to him back, like say, you also speak multiple languages. You just don't know that, or you don't think you speak <laughs> several languages. So the perception of language here is very different. So here, for example, here, Mandarin, uh, Cantonese, or Xiang, or Wu, they are actually linguistically different languages because they are not mutually intelligible. Even though I speak Mandarin Chinese, it would take me a year to be able to have a fluent conversation in Cantonese. It's actually very different. And according to a linguist that I know in France, Alain Rey, uh, Le Français dans le monde, the distance between Cantonese and Mandarin is actually equal to the distance between Swedish and French. So they are actually different languages, but people don't think they are different languages, and they think they are hopeless monolingual. So I change their opinion and thinking about languages. And then uh, the third strategy is to ask them to forget English, learn a new language, because they are stuck in the world of this bad English education. For example, Owen, he learned English for like 20 years, and he still couldn't speak it. So I asked him, why don't you try uh, a new language, Spanish, and learn it like naturally. And so when he was in the States for my English Emerging Program, uh, after, after a few days, he was very frustrated because he thought, I, I, have, I have been studying this language for 20 years. Why can't I not speak this? So I asked him to join a Spanish meetup and say, okay, just uh, pretend that you know Spanish and go there. And after that, he changed his like, opinion about English. He says, oh, I think English is very easy now. <laughs> yeah, that's how it works. And the same example happened in, uh, the, here in Japan. Uh, in uh, Jiba, they have this university called Budodaigak. You know, Budodaigak means like a martial arts school. So those kids, generally, they don't want to study. And they, were, uh, they are usually abandoned by the education system. So they think, oh, I cannot speak English. It's too hard. I don't understand grammar. So uh, my friend Rachel, or Leiko Simitz, um, she used a very unique method. It's called multilingual phonetic approach. So she, she told she, her students, forget about English. At the beginning of every class, I'm going to give you a listening comprehension test in 10 different languages. But you don't need to understand it. You just need to identify which language it is. For example, if I play a Russian uh, sound file to you for 10 seconds, you have to tell me this is Russian. And then you earn one point. So she did that. And after a semester, the students gave us a very good feedback. They said, oh, I think English is easy now. It's learnable now. And I think a language is funny. So uh, it's a, I mean, this multilingual approach of learning a new language actually helps people here overcome this English complex obstacle. And so losing three is to have a real conversation. OK, so people here, they learn language, but they never have any opportunity to talk to other people. So. They always think about it's right or wrong. It's right or wrong. <laughs> Is it perfect? So I always have my uh, uh, emerging program students or members talk to native speakers, even if they don't have a perfect sentence. So this is how I do to them during one of my emerging sessions. I would recruit or hire a Japanese speaker and talking about his life. For example, this guy, he uh, <laughs> opened a restaurant in Albania. And I asked him to talk as if he were facing a group of native speakers, Japanese, Japanese native speakers. Of course, my students or my, the members couldn't understand, but I still asked them to sit there and listen, even if you don't understand. But actually, because you have con con contextual messages and like a background, they could still guess. And after that, I would explain the details. And then I would ask, them, would ask them again to ask two questions. But I don't help them. They have to come up with questions by themselves using Google translators or, translators or any other method. The sentences the, does it, don't have to be perfect. And then they ask the question. If they can get the meaning across, messages across, then they get it. So this is how I train them. Okay, um, for my Chinese immersion program, it's the same. So um, Ito, she was very um, like afraid of speaking Chinese. And then uh, after the program, program she changed. 
Finally, it's about language tests. If you, you go, go out and ask people here, why do they want to st study English? They would tell you, because I want to pass the TOEIC test. TOEIC test. And I think if you are from Europe, you don't even know what TOEIC test is, right? Do you know that? I don't think so. And it's, this is actually very difficult to change, because people still think about tests. And I think the only solution is still communication. So I encourage my members to attend like all these kind of different meetups, <laughs> uh, even using Tinder. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know what? In uh, Japan, Tinder advertises themselves as a language learning app. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> well, I guess it works. OK, to uh, sum up. Because I still have about 10 minutes left. I want to tell you about uh, Tom's adventure in the Amazon. OK, so um, okay, I have 15 minutes to talk about Kitra. So where is Kitra spoken? Um, it's spoken in uh, South America. And it was the uh, imperial language of the Inca Empire. So uh, Inca was called uh, Tawatinsuyu. That means uh, like uh, we conquered four parts of the world. And after the conquistador, you know, the like stories of Francisco Pizarro and uh, all those um, very cruel stories, um, Inca was conquered. But uh, Spanish, the Spaniards, the Spanish people, they continued to use Quechua as an administrative language for like over 200 years. Only in the late 19th century, they changed it to Spanish. So Quechua languages somehow survived. Notice that I said the language is not a language because Quechua is not one language. There are 24 types of Quechua, and they are not mutually intelligible. So um, when I was in graduate school, my advisor sent me to do uh, two months field studies in uh, South America. And so I went there without any uh, manuals or textbooks. And I just lived with the indigenous people there and picked up the language. So it's like a true immersion. It's also controlled because they had time to with me. And they didn't care if I really spoke this language or not. So I uh, spent uh, two months in the Amazon, Ecuador, and came back speaking Kichwa. I still speak it today because now I host a program with my Kichwa advisor through the Andes and the Amazon field school and I sent our members to uh, Ecuador. So two years ago, we had a very interesting learner uh, match. She was not academically oriented, which means she doesn't study a lot. She doesn't even like to read books. <laughs> and she had a very low or intermediate, intermediate level of English, and she had no knowledge of Kichwa and, or Spanish, and she was among like, she was the only non-American students in the forest. So uh, you might wonder, why does she want to go there? And so I asked her, why do you want to go? And she said, because I want to go to the Amazon. <laughs> OK, if you want to go through this program, you can go. So, but you have to learn Kichwa. But what would her strategy be? Think of this. She's not talented like us or like other polyglots. She doesn't even speak English. She's just a. She's a very struggled learner. Plus, Kichwa is a very difficult language if you think um, like uh, linguistically. Uh, first, it has a conjugation system like uh, all those European languages. If you know Turkish, it's just exactly like Turkish. You, you have first person singular and second person uh, singular, blah, 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 blah. And you also have a case, case system like uh, Japanese. You have uh, like a wasi as house, and wasi kuna as plural, that's a nominative. And then you have a wasita, that's the accusative, like uh, the Japanese o, or the Korean l, or the ja uh, Turkish ui. Uh, wasi kunata, wasipa, wasiman, wasimanta, wasipi, wasiwa. And then, the, and then they also have evidentiality in. Turkish is like a mesh, like a oguzel mesh. And in this language, it's like a me. So for example, in Kitra, when you want to say hello, you say kao san gichu, which means like, how are you? Are you still alive? And then you answer. <laughs> and you answer kao san nimi. 
So the the ending me means I'm very convinced that I'm still alive. <laughs> Kanga, and then you say and you, and you answer again. Kao san ni mi. You don't just say kao san ni, which is I live. You have to say kao san ni mi, which means I'm pretty sure that I'm alive. <laughs> I'm still alive, okay. So, I mean, when you have a learner like uh, Match, and she doesn't speak the, the local language, Spanish, and she doesn't even have English, and how uh, would, is he, she going to learn this language? I mean, can you think of any strategy? So that's what I told her. I said, okay, you are not going to understand the grammar points, even the vocabulary like a drills, because they are going to teach you this language in Spanish, because all the indigenous people only speak like uh, Spanish. So forget about this. You can still go, but you, can, you, you are not going to learn from these people. You have to learn from these people. <laughs> these are my friends in the Amazon. So I told them, OK, I have this friend, Madge. Please take care of her. She's very nice. She's going to learn your language. She might learn it very slow, but don't worry, she will get there. And you know, all these indigenous ladies, they were really nice, they were very patient. And they don't mind like spending time, they spend time with you and speaking Kitra. Even if you don't understand, they still continue to talk to you. So this is called a controlled um, emerging environment. All these adults are responsible for you, and they, they love you. They love you unconditionally. So that's very, um, yeah, so emerging isn't everything. You need this kind of environment to be able to do real emerging. And that's why kids or babies, they learn language so well, because the parents, their parents love them unconditionally. Okay, so if emerging doesn't work for you, that's not because emerging is bad, it's because you don't have people <laughs> who love you unconditionally. <laughs> So if you don't have friends, then uh, you can join our immersion program. And I will give you people who can love you unconditionally. <laughs> yeah, so my, my job title is actually native speaker supplier. <laughs> so yeah, so when she was in Amazon, still even she had all those unconditional lovers <laughs> with her, she, was, she would still like, uh, she, she was still frustrated at first because we are adults, we have emotions and we have negative thoughts. So she also, she also experienced that. So um, this is one message she sent me when she was in the forest. So basically, uh, she was saying, she met a, a polyglot, a uh, Mormon missionary there, and she spoke Romanian and Spanish, blah, blah, blah. And she uh, thought she was like, hopeless, because all these people are so smart, and they can learn these languages she will never be able to. It was like uh, day two or day three, but she expected herself like so much, so she got really frustrated. So my second job title is actually a psychological like counselor. <laughs> so I never teach anything. So I have to talk to assure her that you will get there, you will learn just to spend time with my these, these ladies, blah, 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 blah. After about a week, she changed. <laughs> She, she became friends with other American students, and she was able to speak a few words in Kitra, and uh, the Kitra ladies invited her to their like, communities, and so she was happy. And she, since then, she never again sent any messages to me. I was fired. <laughs> so uh, as a proof to show you that she really mastered it, okay, so first a look at the left. She uh, had a date with a local guy. Okay, so why is it a proof? Because she didn't speak any Spanish, and that guy didn't speak any English. And so the only way to communicate is through her broken kitra. So I said to her, you can invite someone for lunch. Then you have learned it. You have learned the language. If you don't think you have learned it, think about it. Learning language is about communication. It's not about getting a good grade. And also, uh, my adv teacher advisor, Dr. Swenson, also wrote her a very good like certificate in Spanish. We don't have time to read it. But anyway, uh, what I want to tell you is even a struggled learner like Match could learn a language by emerging and also um, 
learn like multiple languages. You don't have to be smart. You don't have to have a good analytical ability. You can still learn. It might take longer, but eventually everyone is the same. You might be faster if you are smart. You have a great analytical ability that would give you like six months like uh, advantage. But later, gradually, everyone is the same. Smart, tall, short, or whatever. So Mitch became very confident. The program was only for like one month, but she decided to stay there for another month by herself. So she joined a different community with other women, and she started to learn Spanish actively too. And then after a month, she decided to stay in South America for six months. Wow. And she didn't plan that, because she was just very frustrated with the English and everything, and now she is a trilingual. So when uh, she uh, went back to Taiwan, she uh, gave a very uh, inspiring presentation for us, because how he tra she transformed, how she, uh, as a struggled learner, became a trilingual, and uh, we were all moved by her. Okay, so if you are interested in our program, then you can join us tomorrow. <laughs> okay. okay, that's the end of my talk. I still have seven minutes left for questions. Uh, what I want to say is um, thank you very much for attending my talk. Um, I didn't have enough time to explain everything in details, but uh, I think multilingualism is the key to a better future, especially in this area of the world. You know, in East Asia, we have a lot of problems. We have Chong E Hanen, Kim Jong Wen Tong Zi, and uh, we have Tiger Bee Farm, if you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, so, um, but if we can understand each other and speak each other's language, this area will be much better. And when you watch the news, it, it's not going to be about Kim Jong Un or whatever, or Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, so thank you. Um, please, if you have any questions, and uh, thank you for your help and uh, all my assistance. <laughs> you can use like the regular meetups as a way to make friends, and they might bring you to other communities, and there you can use Japanese. And I have two additional tools for you. and. Uh, the first one is called the um, Kokuchi's. Do you know Kokuchi's? It's a platform like uh, Meetup, and, but it's only for Japanese people. So when you go to the Meetups there, you won't meet people who speak English. And they, don't, they probably just don't want to speak English. And there you can practice Japanese. And the second one is called the P-E-A-T-I-X. P -E -A -T -I -X. And the first one is called Kokuchi's. Cheese, like in cheese. Kokuchi. Kokuchi is to announce and Kokuchi. Okay, later if you need the information, I can give it to you. So I mean, um, even if you go, some people might say, if I go to meetups, they will all talk to me in English. Yeah, that's true, but you can go there for a few times to just uh, build a rapport or bonding. And later they will show you uh, take you to their friends, and then you can build your network. And if you still, still, if you don't like that, you can dig deeper into the Japanese society, like using kokuchis. And the, probably the third thing you can use is a, a hippo family club. Um, it's a multilingual association, but what they actually speak there is Japanese only, basically. <laughs> In Tokyo, anybody from Tokyo? They have this place called the Mickey House Cafe, and they do the same thing we do in Taiwan. Actually, I copied her. <laughs> Mickey House Cafe, yeah. So if you really need to find people to uh, speak Japanese, you can check out Mickey House Cafe, too. People who are multilingual, they can enjoy every table, but uh, other people can still enjoy just one table. And also, um, we instruct people like how to use like the environment. Like if you are not confident yet, you can just uh, listen. Oh, you don't have to sit at the same table for like uh, two hours. You can go there for five minutes and then change table. Just to be relaxed. You don't have to be there like uh, going to an English class and stick to a uh, one teacher. Or some yeah, it's about the you know the environment and the, the atmosphere. So even in my immersion program, I can have. Uh, 
zero, like a true beginner, and also like a very advanced. Okay, I think that's the end of it. Uh, <laughs> okay.